And at age 30, uh, he's entering the Pharaoh's service. After two years of famine, we see Joseph reveal himself to his brothers because uh, they have famine up in the land of Canaan and they come down looking for food. God reassures Jacob that it's okay to move down to Egypt. We see that in Genesis 46. And Pharaoh, this Pharaoh, is friendly toward God and he's friendly toward God's people to the point that he actually invites Israel to come down and dwell in the fat of the land. He didn't give him scrub land. He gave him, gave him Goshen, the best, the best farm ground. And after uh, Jacob had dwelled in that land for about 17 years, he died at the age of 147. And as in the scripture that Ethan read, we see that Joseph died at age 110. But even then, before Joseph dies, we see him talking to his brothers. And he is looking ahead to God's redemption and he clearly understands that God is in control, and he gives his brothers directions to bring his bones up out of Egypt. He's clearly looking forward to God's promises. <clears throat> there is a verse in Esther... I was just reviewing this this morning. If you remember, uh, Mordecai uh, was working with Esther, and uh, God positioned Esther at, at that time to have a key role. And in Esther 4.15, uh, um, basically... Mordecai says to Esther, who knows but that for this time you have been raised up, more or less. That's not a direct quote. But I think Esther understood her role that God had for her at that time for the nation of Israel. And I think Joseph clearly understood what God was doing. I think he understood God's plan. I think he understood the role that God had for him to play out in this master plan. Why? Why did Joseph so clearly understand this? Um, it's not explicit in the Word of God, but I think probably... His father Jacob had passed down things. He probably talked to his sons and relayed to them the promises, uh, the appearances of God to him, the promises that God had made. I think Joseph probably was a man of prayer. And again, I don't see that explicitly in the Word of God, but I think Joseph spent a lot of time on his knees in prayer. I think Joseph did not know about God. He knew God. In sharp contrast to Exodus 1.8, which, which Ethan also read, which says, Now there arose a new king, or a new pharaoh, who did not know Joseph, and he did not know God, and he didn't care about God. I see a parallel with America here at this juncture, America was started by people who feared God, who worshipped God, who loved the freedom to worship God, and now we were coming under a government that is increasingly hostile toward God, a government composed of mostly people who do not know God, very, very few people in our government who care at all about God or fearing Him or worshiping Him. So this is a drastic change we see in Exodus 1.8. We see hostility toward the Israelites, hostility toward God, 
But God is still the same and he's still in control. Now, at this juncture, the Israelites had greatly multiplied, but uh, things were getting tough. They were made to do hard labor, basically. Very hard labor, forced labor. And it had to have been hard at this point to wonder a little bit, what is God doing? And yet, if you go back, all the way back to Genesis 15, even already then in God's first appearance to Abram, God had said that his descendants would sojourn in a land not theirs for 400 years. Uh, so this was pre-announced that this would, would come, that this would, would happen. They may not have realized how hard it would get, though. So I, the application I see here is that just as Israel is experiencing a drastic change here in Exodus 1, their God is the same, and for us as Americans, our God is the same, even though our conditions are going to get tough. They're going to get harder under a hostile government. And this comes back to the importance of God's word. I don't know how much of God's word Joseph had, but whatever he did have, I think he, he probably memorized, he cherished it in his heart and reviewed it and meditated on it, much like David did. Um, David spent a lot of time with the sheep, and I'm sure that he sang to himself a lot of scripture and spent a lot of time praying. And I think it is incumbent upon us to know the word of God, to treasure it in our hearts, to meditate on it, to give us strength. Also, I think, uh, I think of some words in that chorus we sang, said uh, ancient words, and I get the, the, the picture of the patriarchs and the, and the families really passing this down from generation to generation, and I think that's, that's healthy for us to do that too, to pass down not only God's word, but our experiences with God, our faith in God, and, and his promises to strengthen the coming generations. I forgot that I had this up here. Esther 4.15, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So how does this relate to us as modern Christians? Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. We all know that, right? We all know that we're saved by grace, we're not saved by works. We're saved by our faith and by God's grace. And we know that God created every one of us. He formed us in our mother's womb. And he ordained all the days of our life when as yet there was not one of them. God has foreordained works for us to do. God has a job for us, just like he did for Esther. He has positioned us for such a time as this. So it is important that we know God, that we walk with him, and that we are ready and we are walking in these works that God has foreordained for us, whatever they might be. And we need to be on our knees in prayer to discern the role that God has for us and to do these works that he has foreordained. And to do them, not just not in our strength, but in the strength and in the wisdom that he gives us to do them. Now, this will appear to you to be a very strange message because I am going to basically end the sermon and we are going to transition into a very brief mission presentation. Tacked on at the end. This is Webster Cabin at Camp Liwa, Fairbanks, Alaska. This is where Diane and I stayed last summer.